Zach Lowe here on the Rich Eisen Show. How you doing, Zach? I'm hanging in, ready to go back to this for the fourth straight time, unbelievably. What does uh, Warriors Cavs 4 mean to you, Zach? What does it say? This was the first time that I feel kind of tired of it. I was kind of hoping for a little bit of a fresh city, a fresh look, but what it says more than anything else is just the greatness of, of LeBron and and the margin for error that the Warriors have after they signed KD. I mean, they had, they didn't really play a great series. They they faced the first opponent who really tested them, and in the end, you know, none of it mattered. Their talent was just overwhelming, and LeBron's talent was overwhelming in the East, and now we get to see it again. You know, I don't know how competitive it will be, but we'll see. Well, I mean, if Iguodala is not healthy enough to cover LeBron, I, I you know, not to call him the, uh, the Dumars of the, I guess, LeBron <laughs> rules, but uh, if he's not able to, to be there – I mean that that's something that levels the playing field a little bit. That said, I'm I'm wondering if the if the Cavs have this switching defensive ability that the Rockets had to throw the Warriors off their offensive game like they did in the middle part of that Western Conference Finals. What do you think? I mean, they don't. Um, nobody does. I mean, that's why the Rockets were such a unique opponent, and, and they built their team specifically for this series. Jeff Green is an interesting piece for them, but you know, and G- George Hill, who who sort of hasn't really played up to his reputation for the Cavs, is is interesting too. But you know, he's still too little to guard KD, and they still have Kevin Love, so it's not it's not an ideal roster construction. But you know, it's very hard to get the ideal roster construction. Zach Lowe of the Worldwide Leader in Sports, ESPN.com, joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. Where does this uh, these playoffs leave James Harden in your mind, Zach? Um, you know, I, he's going to win the MVP. He'll have deserved it. I, I think it actually leaves him in a better place. I think he wore down a little bit in, in Game 7 last night, but he, he was relentless. He's the second scariest person with the ball in his hands in the NBA behind LeBron. The step back three has really made him sort of unguardable, you know, to the point where he makes it enough, enough of them anyway. So, I, and I think he, I think he earned the respect of the Warriors. And, and I don't know how much they feared him. Or I, I, they don't fear or respect him on the level of LeBron. But I think it, by the end of this series, they were like, man, this dude is relentless. He just keeps on coming. I know. And that said, as you were making your comments, our television side of things is just showing one missed three by him <laughs> it after was bad. another, and it's and and it's difficult to. And I said in the segment before you joined us here that there should be a a most valuable player award for the postseason in every sport, by the way, not just basketball, because you know the MVP trophy is going to be accepted in late June by a guy that was part and parcel of a twenty-seven. Uh, in a row, missed three-point extravaganza, Zach. It's kind of tough to square that circle. I mean, the MVP awards the regular season, right? And and LeBron is the best player. Everybody knows LeBron is the best player. I think it was hard to get past how uninspired the Cavs were in the regular season and how much drama just shakes up that team every year. But, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, you want to say the finals MVP is kind of the most outstanding player, but LeBron didn't win it three years ago when it was Della Vadova and a bunch of other cast-offs in him. I actually voted for LeBron that year, but he didn't win it. And if, if he didn't win it that year, I'm not sure it's possible for anyone on the losing team to ever win the finals MVP again. Jerry West is the only one who's done it. So maybe there should be something for the whole playoffs. Maybe you're right. Yeah, so where do you stand on the LeBron uh, MJ of it all now that LeBron has made eight finals of his career? I mean, I, I said last year – Jeff Van Gundy and I had a whole podcast about this. I think it became a converse, a legitimate conversation of peers last year when they just blitzkrieged the entire Eastern Conference and made the finals again, losing only one game. And I, I think it's a legitimate conversation now. I think they're essentially equal players. And if LeBron keeps playing like this in two, three, four years, I mean, the only ammo you're going to have to say that Michael was – outranking him is just the sheer number of championships and if that's the ammo if that's the argument then that's going to be an unwinnable argument for LeBron but I, I think all the other arguments are going to point in his direction so it's it's sort of you know eye of the beholder kind of thing at this point the fact that he might go somewhere else though uh in in a couple of weeks how how might that change the dynamic the fact that Jordan had obviously two eras of his own surrounding his uh, baseball foray, um, but with the same team, LeBron going Cavs, Heat, Cavs, and now another destination potentially. 
Uh, I, so I guess this is a two-part question for you. How did that Game 7 win perhaps change that dynamic for July 1? And how would his uh, departing change any of the dynamic of what you mentioned about the Jordan conversation, Zach? I, I mean, I guess the Game 7 win probably changed it at least a little bit. It proves to him that, yes, even with the supporting cast in the East for now, until Boston gets healthy and Philadelphia sort of matures, I can still get back to the finals. But both of those things may change next year with those two teams. So I'm not sure how much it mattered. Everything has to matter a little bit. Um, I think what would matter a lot more is if they're surprisingly competitive in this series and really make it a series and push them hard. But if he changes teams again, you know, I mean, I, I, Michael Jordan went and played baseball for two years in the middle of his prime. I, I don't know what what is an apple, what is an orange, how to distinguish between the two. It, it doesn't really bother me or or taint LeBron's legacy in any way if he's on, you know, Team Y next year. And in terms of him potentially hooking up with somebody on July 1 to go to a different team, who's more, uh, who's more apt to join LeBron uh, in just a package deal somewhere or, or join him in Cleveland? Uh, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, which one do you think is more uh, apt to hook up with LeBron come July 1? I mean, I think you got to start with PG only because, you know, he's a free agent, and so his flexibility is much easier. The Spurs have Kawhi under contract for another year and, and therefore hold more cards and, and introduce a sort of third party that can make things a little bit more complex. So I think you have to start with PG. But, yeah, I mean, the, the entire off season starts with those three guys, LeBron, Paul, George, and Kawhi. You can throw Chris Paul in there too. But, you know, those three dominoes are going to define what is going to be just an absolutely bonkers July whenever it starts. Yeah, so how do you think uh, the Chris Paul dynamic plays out now that the Rockets are, are sitting home fishing or what, however you want to put it? I think, I think he goes back there. You know, I, I, my guess is that there were expectations of a full five-year max contract when they, when they acquired him. I, you know, I'm sure that Houston feels a little bit queasy about years four and five of that deal, given that he just suffered another postseason injury in his 33 and, and point guards typically don't age very well. But I would suspect Houston looks at this and says, we were that close. This team works. We'll have to adjust it here or there because Trevor Ariza is a free agent and we have some other Clint Capella is a free agent. Um, but I think they bring CP back. What the rest of the team looks like will be a little bit unclear, but I think he goes back. All right, a couple more minutes left with Zach Lowe, ESPN.com senior NBA reporter. Um, how do you see the finals playing out? How do you see it happening? You know, Iguodala's injury, as you, sh as you said, throws a little bit of a wild card in, but uh, the talent gap is so overwhelming in Golden State's favor once you get past, obviously, the best player in the world that it's just hard to see this unfolding any other way. But what last year was, which was 4-1, and, and that Cavs team was better than this one, um, you know, maybe this one has some defensive flexibility that that, would, that one didn't have. But you got to have offensive firepower to keep up with the Warriors, and, and the loss of Kyrie Irving really kills them in that regard. So it's, it's hard to see this as a long, super competitive series. But, you know, LeBron makes things happen. Yeah, man, you just gave. I mean, I could hear the resignation in your voice a little bit, Zach. You are, you are, you're, you got the fatigue. You got the Warriors fatigue and the Cavs coming, <laughs> coming, coming to the party through um, an Eastern Conference that's not as good as the West. So you don't know how battle tested they are. There is LeBron as the uh, the difference maker, and they just seem a couple of couple of cards shy in the deck. It feels like Zach. Again. Yeah, and and and, the, and you know, I mean, we'll see, right? I mean, if sure. they somehow squeeze out Game One, who, who the heck knows what happens? But it 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 does feel like we just saw the the hardest punch the Warriors are going to take in the playoffs. And you know, this is why there are people who argue for reseeding the playoffs or just seeding them one to sixteen, regardless of conference or whatever you want to do to get that matchup in the in the finals instead of in the semifinals. But that 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 hasn't happened, and here we are. You'd be for that. You, Say again? you would be for that? You'd 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 sign for um, that? Um, you know, I'd I, I have I have I I think it's to me it's more important to get the sixteen teams best the sixteen best teams in the playoffs and the the seeding aspect of it. I would be I mean, Adam Silver has always said the travel 
and, and the unbalanced schedule are obstacles that are, are not solvable right now. There's certainly some truth in that. You know, you got a, a, a Portland Miami first round series followed by another one cross country for the team that wins that is, is, is a problem. Um, I think there are ways around that. Maybe you go back to two, three, two, maybe you shorten the first round to five games. I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing, but I, I do like the idea of a, the 16 best teams get in like the nuggets this season and B you seed so that your two best teams can't meet until the finals. Zach, appreciate the time. Uh, let's chat again real soon. The uh, low podcast, check it out on all platforms that ESPN offers. And then a uh, senior NBA writer of ESPN.com. Let's chat again soon. Thank you, sir. You got it. That's Zach Lowe here on the show. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.